Well, thank you all for coming. My name is Tom Keenan. I teach human rights and media at Bard College outside of New York. Uh, and I'm here in Istanbul with a, a group of students and other faculty from uh, Bard and a number of its partner institutions around the world, ranging from Palestine to Kyrgyzstan. We're very happy to be here, and uh, we're very grateful to Vasif Kortun and the team at SALT for uh, hosting us here this evening. We're going to be talking in uh, different ways about uh, images and online images, uh, the ethical and political stakes of their, uh, of their uses uh, in the Syrian conflict. And we're really um, privileged, I'm very excited to be sitting in between uh, these two gentlemen, um, who, who both have remarkable expertise and experience in thinking about the question of uh, the Syrian conflict in terms which uh, include images and representations, but in extremely different ways. I can't, I probably couldn't imagine two more different uh, ways of pursuing uh, this research and these investigations, but I think you'll see that there are some really remarkable um, conversations uh, which can emerge uh, hopefully in this, uh, in this encounter. Um, so uh, we'll, we're joined by Elliot Higgins on my right, um, who some of you uh, may know under his uh, former pseudonym, at least, Brown Moses. Uh, Elliot has been a pioneer in uh, the open source, um, quasi-forensic uh, investigation of, of online social media um, from Libya, from Syria, uh, and more recently from Ukraine. Uh, and he's going to take us through some of the projects that his new uh, crowdsourced organization called Bellingcat uh, has been doing. Uh, I think it's a real frontier uh, in, um, in civic uh, participation, civic engagement in, uh, in a geopolitical sphere uh, which has historically been reserved for either governments or international organizations or sometimes NGOs. Uh, and uh, with a unique, uh, um, almost uh, and sometimes quite scientific relation, a sober scientific relation to a body of imagery and representations which is often treated uh, as a kind of um, either taken for granted uh, journalistic body or um, a matter for emotions and uh, mobilizing shame and so on. So um, we'll hear from Elliot first and then um, Yassine al Haj Saleh, a Syrian writer and thinker uh, in exile in Istanbul who has written what for me are the most uh, breathtakingly insightful analyses of what's happening in Syria. Completely unforgiving, uh, critical take on all the players in the uh, tragedy that is Syria. Um, so I'm just going to try to hide in between uh, these two guys and, um, and we'll see where it goes. And we're going to leave plenty of time at the end for uh, your questions and comments and thoughts about all this. Elliot. Um, as I've just been introduced, I'm Elliot Higgins. I'm um, currently running a website called Ben and Cat, uh, which I'll come to in a second. I, I started off, though, um, as a simple blogger. I was very interested in what was going on in Syria because I, I'm just one of these people who's interested in current events. I you know, saw what was happening in uh, you know, the countries involved with the Arab Spring, countries like uh, you know, Libya, for example. And one thing that I found very frustrating is there was a lot of Im Im imagery coming from those countries. There were videos, photographs that were broadly being ignored um, by the media. Kind of early on, you had some videos going out, and then there started being questions of verifications, and people saying, how, how can we be sure this is video is real, or how do we know this is from this country or that country? And um, I, I kind of became obsessed with that question. And I, I started a blog, and it, it was really only set up for a place for me to put my thoughts. It was in no way uh, intended to be anything that was going to be read by anyone. It was just kind of for my own entertainment. So um, try not to be too shocked when I show you the site. Um, this is what it looked like. It was pretty ugly looking, pretty basic, but it was just a place for my thoughts. And it became more and more popular. More people started reading it. I started looking at videos and saying, how can I figure out, you know, first of all, where this video was filmed? And I started seeing videos coming from Syria showing, you know, 
different kinds of munitions being used, and I asked myself, well, what is that munition? My background when I started this was uh, working in administration and finance roles, um, nothing to do with the military, nothing to do with journalism, um, and over the last, uh, over a couple of years, I kind of built this reputation, and eventually I founded a site called Bellingcat. Um, I'll explain where the name Bellingcat comes from, because I get it asked an awful lot. Um, it's, it's based on a fable about a group of mice. Um, there's various versions of this, but um, the version I prefer is there's a group of mice, and there's a very scary cat, and they want a warning system so they know when the cat's coming. So they come up with the idea of creating a, uh, putting together a bell and putting it around the cat's neck. But then they realise that none of them actually know how to um, put the bell around the dangerous cat's neck. So this is where the name Bellingcat came from. So Bellingcat uh, was funded through a um, crowdfunding uh, exercise on Kickstarter. Um, it raised um, about £50,000, um, about 200000 euros, I suppose. <laughs> Um, and um, this is the site as it is now. What I wanted to do here was two things. One, the reason I kind of abandoned the brand Moses name is because I didn't want to make it a site that was about me. I wanted to make it about a site for lots of people who were doing this kind of work but weren't getting the same recognition I was. So on the left-hand side, you can see there's this news section, and that's where various people can contribute information. I kind of handpick the writers, um, but it's on a variety of subjects. On the other side, we have resources, and this is guides and... Uh, how-to guides and uh, various uh, you know, videos and uh, you know, things like that to teach people how to do this themselves. So, um, starting with Syria, though. Um, very early on, I noticed something about this, uh, this Syrian opposition, um, the way the Syrian opposition used social media. Because of the limited internet access, quite quickly you had a situation where um, there were kind of Facebook page, Twitter accounts, YouTube channels for specific locations, and only a few of them. They were kind of a local media centre or the local armed groups. And in a way, that was quite useful for organising the information because you could actually just, for example, here, this is my subscription list of a 1,000 YouTube channels that I've subscribed to belong to Syrian opposition groups. And you can just go through that list every day and just see what the latest videos are. Quite easy to do compared to trying to find these videos in the first place. Um, more recently, I've been doing a lot of work with Ukraine, and it's not the same situation there. Because in Ukraine, you have open internet access and anyone can post anything they want, you have a situation where you kind of have to find the stuff, you have to look everywhere. And the internet is a very large place when you're looking for this stuff, even in Ukraine. So um, it, there's advantages and disadvantages to both kind of you know, systems of organisation, but understanding that is very important to understanding any conflict. So one thing I learned very early on is every single day I would go through every single Syrian opposition YouTube channel to see what new stuff had been posted there, looking for things that seemed interesting. And this video um, I'm showing you now is one of the early things that seemed very interesting. Um, this is a pile of cluster submunitions. It was the first video I came across, and I think anyone came across, of evidence of cluster bomb use in the Syrian um, conflict. And, you know, this was mid-2012. This was very early on in both uh, the conflict and my uh, blog. And, you know, what was interesting is I shared this information and Human Rights Watch picked up on what I'd shared. And they wrote this article explaining the use of um, cluster bombs. And what, what I was able to do then by tracking these videos is actually track the use of cluster bombs throughout the conflict. So in October 2012, we started seeing all of a sudden dozens of videos of cluster bomb use. In the previous four months or so, there'd been literally three or four videos. Within one day, there were 10 new videos. The next day, there was another 10 videos. It was like someone flicked a switch. And all of a sudden, there was these lots of videos of cluster bombs. Um, of course, as you can imagine, the Syrian government denied cluster bombs were being used. Um, but what was useful, because we had this huge resource, um, I was able to go through and collect about four or 500 videos of cluster bombs um, in Syria. Um, that information was given to Human Rights Watch, and um, they created visualized, nice visualizations like this, so they could go around saying, actually, there's quite a lot of evidence of this. Each of these marks shows uh, a video that was recorded showing cluster bombs being used. Um, another notorious munition from, from the conflict is the uh, barrel bomb, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, this is what I believe to be the first ever video of the unexploded barrel bomb. Um, and as you can see, it's really not that much to look at. It's kind of rusty looking, it's got this kind of weird handle sticking out the side, it's all kind of squished up. And this, when this first, these were first seen, 
people found it hard to accept that the Syrian Air Force would be dropping these out of helicopters. They just couldn't understand it. So you had kind of articles like this, uh, Bauer Bombaloni on Russia Today. Um, interestingly, this post has now been deleted, yet the author's other work remains. Um, and you had this kind of resistance to you know, the belief that these were being used. But through going through open source information, social media, these videos that were being posted online, you come across a video like this, for example, where you can actually see one of them being thrown out the back of this helicopter, just there. Um, and then you'd find we had videos like this, where this is actually filmed inside a helicopter, um, showing one being pushed out of the back of it. And of course, verification is always a question. So people would see a video like this and say, well, how do you know this is Syria? How do you know this isn't a, you know, this isn't fake, it's not a film set in Qatar, you know, this isn't Hollywood special effects, blah, blah, blah. But note something you can see there? You can see exactly the same thing on Google Earth. You can actually find the exact town that is in Syria, so you can prove that was being dropped on Syria. Um, and using these kind of techniques, various ways to verify this material, you can kind of start building up the evidence. Start finding material like this. This is from a captured air base where the barrel bombs were in storage, ready to be deployed. Um, at the same air base, this is the back of a transport helicopter, which we'd seen earlier in that video. Um, and they've installed a trolley system to help it easier to push them out the back of the um, helicopters. Um, later on, we started seeing a new kind of barrel bomb. Um, it was being used far more widely. It was um, far, far more powerful. It seemed more reliable, more effective, far, far more devastating, um, but just as inaccurate as the previous versions. Um, I mean, this is literally just from a week. And this is just a handful of videos produced in that week. There are massive amounts of these being used. And we have videos like this where you can see the actual bow bombs clearly being pushed out of the back of these helicopters. Um, the one thing about the Syrian opposition groups is they have access to a lot of HD cameras, which is very useful because you can pick out details. It's kind of frustrating when you see videos being posted by um, kind of Shia militias and Hezbollahs because they've got really bad cameras. So they're really low resolution, which is frustrating. But with video like this, you can get images like this where you can actually see a complete bow bomb in flight. And you can start piecing together how are these put together. So you'll find stuff like that and then videos like this where it's being examined on the ground. And um, for example, you see on the front plate on the right hand side, it's got these two plates kind of like that, like a sandwich. That's the fuse. And you can start figuring stuff out. So it has a fuse on one end. It has these three tail fins as well. And these tail fins are to ensure it points downwards onto the fuse, this kind of DIY fuse to ensure it detonates. And this is a consistent design. What was interesting about earlier bow bombs is they were a very inconsistent design. They used all kinds of different containers. They had, some had lots of metal in it, some had short <coughs> metal. I've seen some with short um, saw blades, artillery shells, all kinds of rubbish in them. These were a far more consistent design. Um, this image shows two of them ready to be um, dropped out of a helicopter. This was actually from a uh, martyr's page for a Hezbollah member. Um, so this is actually a member of Hezbollah <coughs> in the back of the helicopter with two barrel bombs ready to be put out. You can see they've even installed wheels on the bottom to help them push them out. And the reason they have three tail fins is because if they had four, they wouldn't be able to push it out of the back of the helicopter. So you can start building a real understanding of these uh, munitions. And this is all based on stuff posted on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. This isn't stuff that's hidden away and that no one can ever find and you have to be a secret agent to go out and find it. It's stuff that's out there to be found. In this example, we're seeing um, the first ever example of a chlorine barrel bomb being used in April 2014. Um, you might just be able to see, if it's good enough, you can see the coloured smoke just at the base coming out. That's the actual chlorine being released. And in some examples, you had a video like this where the actual... Um, uh, bomb hasn't exploded. So you can see exactly how it's put together. It uses the same shell as the other barrel bombs, but they've kind of repurposed it. This time they've put in a complete gas cylinder. They've used much less explosive. They've actually wrapped this blue cord you see wrapped around the neck. That's deck cord. That's explosive. So when that detonates, that just cuts the end of the uh, bomb. And what you can see here is an example where that's actually happened where it's simply just cut off the end of the um, gas cylinder. That reduces the amount of chlorine being destroyed, and we learn this all again from social media. Um, when I was doing the research into these um, um, barrel bombs and chlorine bombs, I found this um, interesting video. Um, this, again, is a barrel bomb. Um, this is an improvised bomb, and this is in Syria. This is actually in Fallujah in Iraq. This was um, video evidence that the Iraqi Air Force had started using barrel bombs as part of its um, you know, uh, munitions. 
And what was interesting about that is we I found these videos purely by accident because I was looking for stuff in Syria. Um, and I shared this with Human Rights Watch. They made a big fuss about this. The U.S. State Department talk, spoke to the Iraqi government, and the Iraqi government said we promised never to use them again. For everyone, not that's true. It's been difficult to establish, but just by finding this information online, you can kind of escalate it and get it to the right people. Um, I'm going to show you something now, which is um, basically something no one's really looked at yet. This is a new kind of barrel bomb. And what's interesting about this one, um, we don't know why yet, but it's been linked to symptoms of a chemical attack and it's leaving these very, this bright red you know, powder. In, in this case, it's been absorbed into water. No one's really looking at this. No one really knows what this is. Yet, it's being used and people are being killed by it. Here's another photograph. This is actually from uh, yesterday. The uh, Syrian civil defense posted this. And this is another example where you can see the soil is red. And this is, you know, just another example of how, even though, you know, you're used to the term bow bomb, there's still a kind of a new story to be told, you know, what is the story behind this strange red color, these new attacks. Never, never been seen before, but here we are. Of course, the biggest chemical attack in Syria was the August 21st sound attacks in Damascus in 2012. Um, I spent 11 months looking into this, looking for every single scrap of information I could find about this. Um, but on the day I create this playlist, because I kind of organized all these social media accounts and I knew where these accounts were, and there were a lot of journalists and people in general saying, okay, where's all this information, where, where's all the videos? I just put together this playlist, and this is uh, 195 videos from the August 21st sound attacks from the, um, the day itself. And I created this, I shared this with journalists, this kind of re resulted in these videos actually getting out there very quickly because they started putting it in articles. Um, and, you know, you can see from the preview, there's lots of videos of victims. Um, and I sent these to chemical weapons experts as well, who were kind of giving their opinions on what it could be. But what was very interesting to me were these videos. Um, this is a, the video showing the remains of the munition that was used in eastern Ghouta. Um, these are really interesting because no one had really seen these before. And there was kind of this whole debate about, oh, well, these could be improvised. It could actually be a rebel false flag attack. It probably hold all the stories. You've had Seymour Hersh saying Turkey supplied the weapons, all kinds of stories. But I had actually, um, here's what they look like. You'll notice they've got this uh, very interesting design. They've got this kind of, these tail fins, rocket. There's this kind of chamber at the end. But I'd actually seen these before. This is from um, Adra in August 5th. Um, a few week, uh, weeks before the August 21st chemical attacks. This was a pretty much completely unreported chemical attack that occurred. Um, I think the reports at the time said a few hundred were, injuries were reported, but very few deaths. And it was completely ignored by the media. There's no reports about this. It's like it never happened. Yet, we can see it's the same munitions that were used in this earlier attack. In fact, I found this video of the same munition uh, used in another reported chemical attack, which was completely ignored in Adra, Damascus, 2000, um, 2013. One in Daria in Damascus in 2013. Another one a couple of weeks earlier. Um, so as you can see, when there was this talk of, oh, well, the, we've never seen these before. Maybe they've been made by the rebels. All of these videos were attacks reported by the rebels in their positions. There was a, you know, there was a whole series of events. And no one had noticed these. No one had taken any notice of this whatsoever, because not you know a thousand people didn't die because there were you know a couple of hundred injuries reported. They won't bother looking to it any further. And in most cases, even if they wanted to, they wouldn't even know where to start. Um, so you can see that's quite a big issue when it involves something like the August twenty first sound attacks. Um, what happened? Usually, usually, when I'm working, I try not to talk to activists on the ground too much because I don't want to kind of create a feedback loop where, where they start feeding me the sort of information I want to hear. But um, when I was looking into the August 21st attacks, I was actually contacted by um, activists on the ground in um, Eastern Ghouta. And they said, do I want to speak to one of the doctors who was um, treating the patients? And I was speaking to the doctor and he was telling me various interesting details. Um, one thing he said was the symptoms were exactly the same he saw when he was treating victims of the August 5th attack in Adra. Um, again, something that went pretty much completely unreported. Um, but what, what was interesting is that I, they were saying, well, we'll help you any way we can. I said, well, if you're walking down the street and you see one of these, or you know where any of these are, just take photographs of the munitions, because we don't know anything about these. We want to figure out what they are. So um, later that day, they got on Skype, and they um, said they wanted to talk to me. And they turned on the camera, and they were... Um, it's kind of It was a very poor connection, because it's a satellite phone. And as it cleared up, it was 
started this tube shape started coming along and I started recognizing the tail fins. And what they'd done, rather than taking photographs of it in the street like I said, they'd actually picked one up and take, took it home with them to their apartment. And I said, you realize that's like a chemical weapon you're holding. And they said, don't worry, we're keeping it on the balcony. It's perfectly safe. But what they started providing were photographs like this, um, measurements of the entire munition. They sent me 57 photographs where they measured every single part of the munition. They did close-ups. This was information that no one had. I very much doubt anyone had this, intelligence services, anyone, outside of the people who actually built these in the first place. So using these photographs, I worked with Human Rights Watch on their initial report, and we built this diagram, um, piecing together the different parts of the rocket. And this is, um, you know, this still stands today. The front end is still a bit of a question mark. Um, I won't go into that because that's a kind of very boring academic debate. But there was something very interesting. So what you have, you have this rocket on, the rocket engine on the right hand side. That extends into this chamber that has chemical agent in it, which we will discover what that is later. Um, the chemical agent in the chamber is, has got a metal skin around it. That metal skin has been pre-weakened to come apart in a certain way, and there's a very small explosive charge in the end that breaks it open. I were able to figure this out from the remains of the munition. But what's interesting is I came across these two videos. This shows another one that looks just like the same munition, except they show the end of it and you can see this yellow powder. That's uh, high explosive powder. So, and you'll see another example here where it's the same kind of munition, and again, they'll be digging out the, uh, they're taking it apart and examining it. But it was explosive, not chemical like I'd seen before. And I started noticing there were differences between the two types. So on the left-hand side, these are numbers painted on the um, chemical type, um, and all in red. And you'll also notice they go up to 197, and I've only ever been able to find about 15 of these rockets used anywhere, which suggests there's about 180 left to be used somewhere, and they haven't been declared to the um, OPCW either, which is worrying, obviously. Um, right-hand side, we have the explosive example, where the numbers are painted in black, and those numbers go all the way up to 900 in this example. So we've got a chemical version and an explosive version of these rockets. Something else I noticed was the base of the, um, the warhead. This is from the chemical version where you can see there's two holes. There's one on the left and one on the right. And on the explosive version, there's one hole. And we realized that's because I, I got them to take photographs of that hole, and it's actually a screw cap. And I was like, okay, why is that important? Sound is a liquid. Uh, everyone calls it sound gas, but it's a liquid. And this is kind of the best way to obviously put a liquid into a, a container like this. If it was a gas, this would be no use whatsoever. If it's a solid, it would just be a pain. Um, so this kind of was the first clue it was a liquid kind of chemical weapon. And I got kind of obsessed about the details of these because people were saying, well, maybe the rebels have made a copy of a weapon that's been used before. So I went back and I looked at every single example we had and checked really minor details. So I looked at this where I could see whether it was Put together, I could say, okay, this bolt is here in this example from June. This this being welded like this, I could see the same bolts and welding in the same in the volcano as it's called in January as well. I could see it in the August twenty first one. It was put together in exactly the same way. I also looked at the bolts that were on, used to screw the explosive warhead and the chemical warhead to the rocket, and the bolts were exactly the same. They're in the same arrangement. They used alternating bolt sizes as well. They were absolutely identical. But the question remained, who was responsible for the attack? And this video was posted shortly after the attack, showing what looked like one of the rockets um, being loaded into a launcher and fired. And we dug around and we found this photograph. This is from Aleppo in November 2012, um, showing one, um, one of the rockets in a dual barrel launcher. We looked at government-controlled Meza Air Base at the end of 2012 and found this series of videos that showed these um, same rockets being launched from Meza Air Base um, in Damascus, in the west of Damascus. Um, we found about a dozen videos of these in total, but there was something that kind of stood out that concerned me a bit. Because on the right-hand side, you see one of the Volcano rockets that was used on August 21st. And on the left, you see the one that was um, in the earlier video. You can see they're not the same size. So I realized there are actually not only two types of these rockets, chemical and explosive, there are actually two sizes. And this is all from social media. All this information is coming from social media. And then um, the Syrian government, um, just in October, just seems to stop caring that anyone knew that they were using them. These are all videos from Syrian government sources. This is the National Defense Force here, showing them with the rocket launchers. 
And for example, here's one that shows a very nice clear launch. Um, and then this next video was actually shown on Syrian state television. So it seemed in October when the threat of invasion from uh, America had subsided, they became far more relaxed about showing these off. Um, this video was very interesting as well because we were trying to figure out the range of these rockets as well because no one knew what the range was, so no one knew where they could have come from. And in this video, it shows the entire launch. It shows the launch. It shows the impact, which you'll see in a second as a flash in the um, distance. And six seconds later, you hear the noise of the explosion. And that means we could use the speed of sound to calculate the range, which was over two kilometers. And we kept finding these. This is um, Hezbollah um, using the same rocket system as well. These are the explosive type, fortunately. And they even showed up in the Hezbollah um, propaganda as well. You can see it on the bottom left-hand corner, the same launcher. And through all this information, we established a huge amount of information about them. You had three sizes. There was this small 107 millimeter rocket motor type. That seemed to be the kind of original version that all these others were based on. Then you had this 122 millimeter rocket type. That's the sort that's used on August 21st. And then this very large 220 millimeter motor type. That is the equivalent of about a Scud missile's payload and has a range of about two to three kilometers. It seems to me these were all developed to meet the challenge of urban combat in the Syrian conflict. It wasn't because they were, um, you know, they weren't just making things up as they were going along. This was meeting a specific need of the government, uh, government forces. There was also another rocket that was used on August 21st. This was in the west of Damascus. This is a different kind of rocket. And um, this is an OPCW member. He's measuring it, taking photographs. And I thought, if only I could measure it myself. And I was looking at this picture and thinking, well, he's got measuring tape, so why don't I just cut the measuring tape out and use that to measure the actual <laughs> rocket? And it was 140 millimeters wide, which was interesting, because um, this is another video of it. We found diagrams of 140 millimeter rockets. And here you can see the um, uh, ventrals on the end of it. That's um, 10 holes. And it just happens that a type of rocket called the uh, M1440 uh, millimeter rocket matches this perfectly. You'll see there's a 179 written on the end there, which you can also see in the diagram. It's the same number of nozzles. And what's really interesting about that is the M14 um, actually uses a sarin warhead in some circumstances. So we had all this information, you know, pointing towards sarin, and we knew a lot about the rockets that were used. This map was published by the White House um, when they were kind of making their case for um, why the um, Syrian government did this. And this is an absolutely terrible map. Um, completely unhelpful, and it's plain wrong in some areas. And in one area that's of particular interest is this area. This is the area where, um, it, there's, a map, there's a Malka area as where a lot of the rockets in eastern Buta landed. I think pretty much all of them did. And this is what it, what it looks like. You basically have Jabal to the south, which is here. To the north, you have Kavan, and then in the middle, you have this industrial district. And... The, in the months prior to August 21st in June and July, the Syrian government decided they were going to capture this area. First, by pushing through the industrial di district, separating the two areas to the north and the south. And then they were going to attack and surround the two areas. How do I know this? Well, a TV channel called Anna News, a Russian language channel, were embedded with the Syrian government forces whilst they were doing it. And in one of the videos, they helpfully explained exactly what they were trying to do. So um, I watched all, I think there was about 25 videos, they're all about 10 minutes long, and they show this kind of footage where it's, you know, high def, cameras mounted on tanks, and it allows you to establish every single, the location of every single video and the progress of that operation. So I, made, was, I was making maps like this where I was mapping out the position of the camera, because they're positioning the camera obviously in places where it's safe to put the camera. So you knew the stuff <laughs> control that. You could see them moving through buildings and, you know, clearing buildings as they were going along. I could establish where the government had been in the two months prior to the August 21st sound attacks. We had videos like this from the opposition side, which were showing, um, you know, sporadic attacks on checkpoints in the area. And this is an attack, uh, attacks on this one checkpoint here, where it's a uh, very small checkpoint. But before and after August 21st, there's just all these kind of random videos. It's not a very intensive attack, but it did establish there was a checkpoint in this area. And you can use things, for example, what you have here. The top image is from Google Earth. And the bottom image is from the video. And I was able to establish the exact position the video was filmed from by using Google Earth um, topography. This is just available on Google Earth. So you can see it matches perfectly. There's other elements, like I could match all the mosques as well. 
you know, the position of the bridge. And by doing that, I was able to establish the position of checkpoints as well. So then we were just looking at the underpass checkpoint to the north. Um, Tommy checkpoint was actually destroyed in a um, suicide bomb attack uh, the day after August 21st as a revenge for the attack. Um, but I was able to establish this as an area of control of the Syrian government. And then what I did, I looked at the images of the volcano rockets, and I was able to basically analyze satellite map imagery to establish the exact position these rockets landed in. So this is one area. I can see the view north, and I can see buildings that match. Um, that mark position on Mark II, you can actually count the windows, and there's the same amount of windows. That's visible on satellite map imagery. I also took the view east of the same location where I could match the local, everything to the east. Um, I did this with five rockets. So what you have here, you have the positions of the rockets. These are precise to the meter positions of the rockets on the bottom right-hand corner. The red lines are the two-kilometer range. That's the minimum range established. The green lines are the 2.5 kilometer range. That's the kind of maximum we kind of established. And you'll note they all fall inside government held territory. And you have to understand there has been a massive amount of debate about who was responsible. And one of the big points of uh, contention was were these rockets in range of government held territory? Because a lot of people didn't realize this military operation was going on, they didn't realize what was being captured. And by doing this analysis, I was able to actually establish where this was all um, happening. Now back to the White House map. So this is the area they marked. And if you look at a zoomed in version of this, you'll see, you see that kind of um, off green area in the middle. And just to the north of that, that's an area that isn't marked with anything. That says absolutely nothing. And the Americans are saying they know exactly where these rockets were launched from. Yet the area I've marked in green is the same area they failed to mark at all. So using this information, it was possible to establish that the Americans kind of didn't know what they were talking about when they said that, or at least were not given the full picture. Um, this is an example I've done actually um, very recently. It was for a Dutch newspaper. This is kind of a different piece of work. Now there's a lot of interest in people going to um, Raqqa to join the Islamic State. And this is a um, woman uh, about 30 years of age who went there with her two children, who I believe are seven and nine. Um, she's Dutch. And the question was whether she was actually there or not, because no one had been able to actually establish if she was in Raqqa in Syria. And all she had done to prove it is post this one photograph. And all you can see there is the minaret of this mosque. She's taking, you know, most of that is a wall and just a minaret and a couple of other things. It doesn't seem much there to go with. And we were asked to say, can we find exactly where this woman took this photograph from? So we started looking through pictures for every single mosque we could find in the Raqqa region, not just the city, but the wider region. And we managed to find this mosque, um, which had a very similar minaret. Um, and we've got another photograph of it there. And the thing with minarets, they don't always tend to be the same design, so they can be a good indication of where you need to look. So here we actually compare them side by side, and you can see they're very, very similar. Nearby, uh, we found a photograph of a uh, radio mass that just happens to look exactly the same as the one in the photograph. And then we were able to line up various elements in the photograph, for example, the position of buildings, and figure out where she was actually stood. And we created a simple 3D model just to give us a guide to where everything was in the picture, um, and it matched it perfectly. We could confirm that she was in the Iraq province and exactly where she, she was in that area. Um, and that's something we're actually publishing details of today. But it's one thing to do all this work. It's actually another thing to teach other people to do it. The big problem at the moment is it's very difficult to get involved with all this information. There's so much of it is out there. It's kind of it seems very chaotic. But there is a certain amount of organisation behind it. So um, a project we're going to be launching soon, hopefully, is something called Syria Right Now. Um, what we I've realised, as I had said before, opposition groups have kind of, you know, they, each group has a Facebook page, a YouTube channel, and a Twitter account. Very common in Syria. And they tend to be linked to one geographical location. So we're creating a database of every single one of those accounts. We're tagging them by location. And what you'll be able to do, this is, um, this is actually live at the moment, but it doesn't have all the data in it. Um, this will change, by the way. Um, you can say, okay, I want to know what's happening in East Scooter. Click on East Scooter, and it'll show you every single social media account in the area. It'll show you a stream of the latest videos, the latest tweets, the latest Facebook posts, um, which you can see here. But for me, that was you know, part of the solution. But I wanted to make the discovery kind of process a lot easier and a lot more involved. So I've um, been working with a group called CrisisNet, and very early on I sent them a list of all the Facebook channels and YouTube channels I have. 
And they started creating maps like this where they could show kind of, um, you know, keyword searches and create a map of violence in Syria. Um, for example, the frequency of mentions of bow bombs reports in different months, different times. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to create a live map of um, social media um, posts from Syria. So you'll be able to have a map where, because we're going through and geotagging all these accounts, we're also geotagging locations. So if a tweet says this has happened in uh, you know, a certain area of Damascus, it'll be able to geotag that based off that name being mentioned to a map. So you'll have this live map of Syria, all this stuff's going on. So, and you'll be able to do various searches and say, okay, how many times is this, you know, in this area has this word been mentioned, so on and so forth. But I want to make the discovery process as easy as possible. So what will also happen, if a word like chemical is mentioned, it'll create a uh, warning. It'll send a tweet out on a special Twitter account. It'll say, this social media account has just mentioned the word chemical. You'll be able to click into that. It'll then take you to all the social media accounts in that area so you can see other reports, you can keep an eye on it. And it means rather than you going through the hours and hours of searching through these accounts, trying to figure out what's going on, um, even if you're bothering to look, the information will be there coming to people. People can just follow a Twitter account and know the second the word chemical is mentioned, or the word chlorine, or the word barrel. Um, and, of course, once you've got that, the question is how, you know, it's not just about getting the information, but then verifying it. So um, we've been using a platform called um, Checkdesk recently, and it's a very simple kind of platform, like a blog, but what it allows you to do is, for example, we were discussing this um, execution video the Islamic State posted, and we basically had the video and we broke down the different elements of it. So on the right-hand side, we've got a discussion of power lines, because you could see power lines in the videos, and we were trying to establish where they were. Um, and this is basically a very open platform, because the problem is a lot of this discussion is taking place on social media at the moment. And social media is really a temporary thing. For example, um, with the August 21st sound attacks, I looked into um, how many Facebook pages that had been reporting first-hand accounts had been deleted. About 90% of those pages had been deleted in uh, three months of the August 21st attacks. And these were first-hand reports of those attacks. Um, so what the good thing about this site is that you can embed all these discussions. You can keep these discussions and you can say, OK, can we look at how we went through this process step by step when we originally looked at it? It also allows people to expand on what you've done so far. So really, for the work I'm doing at the moment, it's kind of looking at what I've been doing and say, OK, how do you make this as easy as possible? How do you make it as accessible as possible? How do you make it as transparent as possible? And how do you get more people actually doing it? Um, so that is what I'm trying to achieve with Bellicat at the moment. So thank you. Good that uh, these days are uh, the fourth anniversary of what you like to call it conflict, as these two gentlemen lose the star, crisis, war, rising, revolution. What is it? I think it is not a matter of. Terminology is a political. Uh, it is a political uh, discussion. When it is a crisis or it is a conflict, so there are no ethical dimensions of this conflict. We have bad guys that we don't know <coughs> if they are thinking rationally or there are ethical rules for their conflict. And, of course, we omit that we, uh, we tend to forget that there is history of the sides. We uh, usually reduce ourselves or reduce our perspective to thinking of the last few weeks or few months or few years. Now, there is no history of the struggle, of, of, no history of the sides that we don't know the precedences of the struggle, for instance, that Syrians has, have struggled before, that they, uh, they were uprising before, that they, they were political uh, prisoners, for instance, that they were people killed. And so 
when we use conflict, words like conflict or war, I think we are showing signs of disrespect to the uh, Syrian population who are for the fourth year um, struggling hard. And well, now it is war. Actually, it is war, and we have perhaps we can speak. It is not only uh, true to speak about war, uh, civil war. It is a regional war, it is perhaps sort of apocalypse, because we have all the world in Syria. Um, Syria is a country without inside, without borders, and inside is uh, the outside world is inside Syria, Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, uh, people from Depends of nationalities, uh, Sunni jihadis came to Syria, and Shia jihadis came up from many countries and many uh, um, many regional powers are involved and many international powers also. But the beginning was peaceful uprising, and uh, I think the majority of Syrians prefer to uh, that their struggle acknowledged as uh, um, uprising and revolution with ethical and with political roots. There's matters of responsibility, of justice, of, uh, of freedom, of, uh, of it is not uh, only a conflict. So um, uh, I wanted to uh, say this uh, Remark because in the Western media, and I think in, uh, in uh, local media in Turkey, they prefer words like crisis or war or conflict. What I found amazing about Elias' work is that he relied heavily or solely on local sources. He said that all, the, or the majority of his videos are from uh, social uh, yeah, networks yeah. of Syria. So they were citizen journalists. They were uh, people like us. None of them, nearly none of them, is uh, a professional journalist or a cameraman. Um, so also, I think. This is um, the important thing about this work is that uh, when relying on local sources, um, uh, Eliot is giving Syrians the right to represent themselves, to narrate their own story, to tell the world that we, we saw this, we suffered this, we did this, and this happened here or there in Syria. Uh, Elliot uh, mentioned, for instance, Seymour Hirsch. Seymour Hirsch built a whole story, a grand narrative, with Turkey, with Jabhat Nusra, with the Syrian regime, with Russia, with uh, big players without uh, relying at all on any uh, local sources. And this applies to, to our friend, uh, your... Uh, Citizen Robert Fisk, who wrote a lot about Syria, um, and actually he, he visits Syria several times, but only to meet people like Bashar Assad, Bukhain Shaban, security officers, high security officers, and uh, people like this. Never, never. And he, he's able to go to, to the same water, for instance, or to ask at least his friend, Bukhain Shaban, to allow him or to link him with people and some, uh, I mean, some grassroots. But he preferred to tell stories from some security dungeons. I was myself uh, a prisoner for years, for long years, and never has it happened that a foreign journalist or a human rights activist came and visited us and brought us chicken <coughs> and potatoes like the story that Robert Fisk uh, told about his visit to some uh, 
Al-Qaeda uh, agents in, 2000, in summer 2012. Now, uh, I have a question for Elliot. Uh, how can we read the political? Uh, how can we read the political history of the Syrian struggle? through these video, videos. I know, for instance, I read an in, uh, interview uh, with you that uh, you know that the cluster bomb was used for the first time in summer 2012. At that time, there was a, a big uh, uh, turning point. For instance, the uh, cell, the crisis cell in Damascus was assassinated, you know, as Shaukat, Shamkhdiar, uh, and others were assassinated. And for the first time, fighter jet uh, jets were used against cities and squad missiles and uh, queues of people waiting to take bread from bakeries. And so, can we conclude? Do you think that it is legitimate to conclude from? Uh, what you discovered about cluster bombs and about the first chemical uh, attacks. They happened also in the second half of 2012. Something related to the history of the Syrian, of the Syrian conflict? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's absolutely um, true. You know, these videos are part and parcel of the conflict. They're, they're what's happening to people on the ground after pe decisions are being made by the military, by the government, it's the government reacting to what's happening in the conflict. And, you know, without these videos, really what would we know about a lot of what's going on on the ground in Syria? The amount of information we've gleaned from these, just these videos, these accounts, you know, especially now that there's this kind of thing where unless there's a video of something, it's never happened. This is a very poisonous kind of um, trait that's kind of being, you know, given to the Syrian conflict and it's being passed on to other conflicts. It's like a disease that unless there's a video or a photograph, then it's like something didn't happen. And even then, it's like, unless a journalist saw that video or photograph and had someone tell them it was okay to use that video or photograph, that never happened. So what happens to the history of the people on the ground? Um, you know, just, uh, I'm sometimes feeling what I'm doing is more about archiving the history of the conflict than really analyzing it. And especially when it spills, you know, quite frequently, you know, you can write as much as you want about chemical attacks, but no one's really going to do anything about it. So what you're doing is recording, you know, these attacks happen, these are the videos that show them happening. So in 10 or 20 years, when Syrians are saying what actually happened here, it's not just the, you know, one version of the story they're hearing, and they can go back and look at that information. I think that's um, hugely important, and I, it, I, I'm glad there are organisations who are kind of pursuing that agenda and are trying to collect this information for the future. But, but it's not only for the future, right? I mean, you're, uh, the, the work you're doing does seem to be also inscribed in, uh, if not directly in the conflict, in the work of organizations that are trying to intervene in one way or another in the conflict. Well, it, it's been interesting. There's a definitely more and more organizations who are very interested in using this. I, you know, it, it's been that really human rights organizations, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty have been really the first people to adopt this work. You've had sort of media organizations kind of realizing it's a good idea, but their journalists are generally too busy to sit down and look through hundreds of YouTube videos a day for a story. So they kind of rely on human rights watch and people like me to find the stories to them and then say they're okay. Um, I, I find myself, there's a very interesting report called um, Serious Socially Mediated Civil War, where they were talking about the use of um, how these gatekeepers have kind of um, arisen from the conflict. People like myself who um, you know, for the media, we're the people they look at for what, where the stories are. So we end up with this kind of responsibility. If we're not writing about something, it's almost as like, in the eyes of the media at least, nothing's happening. Because they're not looking at the kind of open source information, the social media content. They're just relying on people like me to find stuff for them to write. Um, but, you know, it, it, what I find with Syria is people, it's more that people are learning the lessons of using this kind of content in the future rather than it being any use um, in many, you know, to change in the way the conflict's going. I mean, I, I, it, sometimes it feels like what I've done to change, you know, changing the conflict, it really hasn't done anything. It's increasing the understanding of what's happening, but really it's down to, you know, governments to decide what happens next. So it's, I can, 
as I've showed you, I can get as many videos of chemical weapons as I want, but unless there's a government who actually wants to do anything with them, nothing's going to happen. Uh, have you, Elliot, uh, have you found any um, signs that there are uh, deliberate uh, uh, false information? Uh, sorry. Have you found any signs of deliberate uh, falsification, videos, false videos or uh, uh, false information from in the social media uh, sites? Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, you can have to consider there's about half a million videos that we produce from Syria, if not more. I mean, this is a vast number of videos. You find a handful that are kind of, I mean, fake might even be a bit of a strong word. I mean, some of it is just sometimes they overplay what's going on, but those are a very small number. And that's both sides. The real elaborate fakes seem to come more from um, the more pro-government perspective. So I've seen, you know, there's... Um, some very uh, notorious videos claiming to show um, uh, one rebel group launching the August 21st sound attacks, but it was kind of fairly, it's, it's so obvious it was fake, it was almost comical to me, but you had these really badly shot videos, and the people who make these videos in this group, they make really well shot videos. They used a really bad cell phone camera, they were holding the camera in the wrong, wrong way, they kept saying the name of the group over and over again. Everyone was wearing gas masks apart from the cameraman who had it off so you could hear him say who they were and what they were doing. Uh, they draped their flags absolutely everywhere like it was some sort of kind of you know, party they were having. It was just really overdone. And um, another good example, you know, simple example. If you see a video in Syria and it's been posted onto a brand new YouTube channel, and that's the first example of it, that's immediately suspicious. Because as I've been saying, these groups use the same channels over and over and over again. So with the Syrian hero boy video, which you're probably all familiar with, um, you know, show this young boy, you know, apparently being shot and then rescuing this young girl, and they got lots of shares. And some newspapers were saying, "Oh, look at this amazing video from Syria." The thing that really stood out to me was that it was posted on a brand new channel, and it also used English in the title, which is something you never see in these videos. So when journalists were coming to me, I was saying, "Just hang on, because I don't. There's something off about this video." I wasn't. I was, unfortunately saw it when I was on a flight to New York, so I just said, this looks pretty crazy, but I'm not sure if it re it's real. Um, but I was advising journalists to say, just hang on with this, because there's something really odd about how this has been shared initially. And then eventually it did turn out that it was a, uh, just a fake that had been produced to raise awareness of the Syrian conflict, but really it raised awareness of everyone worrying about everything being fake from Syria. Which, <laughs> Um, in a way, it's good because it keeps people sharp, but on the other side, it gives those sort of people like to dismiss this material away to say, oh, well, it's just like the Syrian Hero Boy video, without actually engaging with the content. Would I like, uh, well, I would like to address a certain issue that's of vital importance now on the cultural and ethical level and political level in Syria. Uh, between, among intellectuals and the filmmakers, especially, are a heated debate. Uh, there's a heated debate among intellectuals, uh, writers, and uh, filmmakers about uh, images, uh, videos uh, that are coming from Syria. You know uh, the uh, uh, images of 11 people killed under torture, Caesar uh, images that. Some of them were displayed recently in the UN in New York. And um, I think the majority of us have seen some of them, and they are horrible. And uh, though we saw only, I think, tens of them. Now, I, um, I want to hear from you and perhaps from the audience. Uh, what do you think about this? Uh, is it OK, the, the debate among Syrians uh, like this? Some of them want that there should be restrictions on showing this to the population. But this raises questions. Who 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 uh, put the rules? What uh, images should be seen and what should uh, uh, not be seen? And when we have these images, who are the ones that uh, see them and prevent others from seeing them. And others, and I admit that I am one of them, uh, say, uh, or from the opinion that we are in um, foundational crisis. And 
it is not a political crisis. It is something normal. It is uh, something related to the meaning of our country and our life and constitution and everything. Uh, so we have to look into our mutilated uh, bodies and die. We have to look in these uh, horrible uh, images and to uh, try to digest this in a way and to build our new thinking, new culture, new concepts about society, about culture, on uh, uh, digesting this experience. So what do you think about uh, this, uh, Tom? Do you want to add? Well, I, I just want to add, um, the, speaking of the Caesar photographs, actually about a thousand of those photographs have now been leaked online. And people have actually been going through them and finding their family members and saying, this is you know, my uncle, or this is my son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they've started doing that now, going through these images. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, Elliot. Only the day before yesterday, a friend of mine uh, living now in Duma, uh, Duma is in the same Ruta, and uh, uh, the, uh, the chemical attack uh, happened there. Uh, uh, sent me a letter that, saying that they saw two photos, and they thought that one of them looks, looked like Suhaib. Suhaib is his wife's brother. And some people began to send uh, expressions of, of, of solidarity with them. That this is Suhaib, the martyr, and and another photo of Iqbal, who is Suhaib's brother. And so, so there are a lot of social and a lot of human dimensions of that. Because, and the, the, the painful thing about the, the tragic thing is that people are never sure that this is Suhaib, or this is Muhammad, or this is uh, Omar. Or, and they keep looking on to, to the images. Is, is he? Is this he? Now, because all the uh, images are, all the bodies are in trouble uh, condition, and uh, they spent uh, a year, two years, three years in prison, and no one knows what happened to them in the spirit. I'm sorry. I would just directly answer your question. I, I share your position. I think it's important to look. I think the, the images that we're presented with um, from what's happening in Syria are a, make a claim on us, make a demand for our attention, and uh, it's important uh, to see them, to look at them and try to see them. But I think there's, a, there's lots of different ways, in fact, that one can look at them. And I struck, I don't know if you have on your computer the image that you made of the of the Daesh video of Foley's execution, um, but so I'll just describe it if you don't have it. But um, Elliot uh, geolocated the the place outside Raqqa where um, the where the where Foley uh, was executed. Um, but when uh, he did this analysis, the 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 figures of the two, um, the two human bodies, the executioner and the executed, are masked uh, in, in uh, Eliot's online image. And our attention is drawn to what was inadvertently recorded by the video camera, which is the topography of the hills behind, uh, the hills and valleys and uh, um, green spots uh, in the far distance. Um, so something completely different came out of, uh, of looking at that image, not, not just the, um, your first response, uh, which is the horror or the shock, or I suppose for some audiences, the, the pride and excitement uh, of that moment. Um, but that's without, um, without giving up the, the detailed examination of the image, you find something else in it. And that feels to me like a kind of... Um, signature uh, of the work that you've been doing is, uh, un is using these images as a kind of, using the images as a, a mechanical um, set of sensors for all kinds of things in the, in the landscape, in the world, in, the, in what's pictured there um, that are not the, not the aim of the image originally, whether it's for propaganda purposes or uh, for terror or just for documentation. Uh, but other things come out of the images uh,
given a different mode of looking at them. That seems to me to be uh, one way of describing what you're doing. For me, um, one big motivation for that is I, I, I really hate when I see those kinds of images and they mosaic, uh, you know, the horror, but, you know, they kind of hide it. It's like lingerie, it's not like pornography. Well, I really hate that. And one thing that I found was really, I don't like talking about the Foley thing too much because what really made me angry was I went to lengths to cover up everything. I used shapes that weren't just round, they were just round shapes. They weren't, you know, oh, here's an outline of the body, here's an outline of the head. It was like just big black shapes. Because I was just focusing on the background. I blanked out the flags, I blanked exactly. out the, yeah. everything. And then lots of newspapers saw me doing that. And, you know, it's a big story. So they republished my work. And when they republished it, they used their own photographs where everything was mosaic, everything, you could kind of figure out what was going on. And that was really frustrating for me. Because I'm, um, you know, I'd exchange emails with James Foley. I couldn't say I was his friend, but we were certainly in contact. But I knew a lot of people who were his very close friend. And the day that video came out, um, it was posted onto this file sharing site that was very, very slow. And the problem was that meant, a, you know, this big 300 megabyte file took about half an hour to download, even though it was a four minute film. And basically, I had watched that film buffering every five minutes, five seconds of this video, bit by bit. And when, when I realized what it was, I had to go and tell lots of people who knew him, don't go onto social media because this video is being posted and you don't want to see what people are posting from this video. And then to, I think this post is kind of a way of saying, look, there is something you can take from this video that isn't just the horror. Um, but then to then have that kind of taken away from me by news organizations who then decided to take away that censorship I put onto it for a very specific reason was incredibly infuriating. Can you talk a little bit, I want to go back to the, the question about the word conflict, um, which Yassin raised. And it seems to me that um, he's speaking from an from a, um, engaged, uh, ethical, and political position on what's happening in Syria. Um, and you don't have to be. I, don't, I, don't, uh, I, can, I can guess, I can uh, imagine some of your feelings, but the, the work that you do has a certain kind of uh, dispassionate uh, technical rigor, which in principle could be applied uh, to anything and, um, uh, and from a lot of different political positions. I w that seems to be a, an intentional methodological choice that you've made, but I wonder how you think about that in relation to your own uh, political and ethical commitments. Um, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> the way I approach my work is I'm really interested in the mythology of something and how something. The morphology? Done. The method methodology. Methodology, sorry. Uh, and it's, for me, with Syria, if I had done this August 21st sound attack work and it had pointed to opposition groups, I would have published that equally as the other thing. I've done a lot, lot of work on um, Ukraine, same with MH17. If the evidence for MH17 was pointing to the um, Ukrainian government being responsible, that's why we've been written about. Um, the, the issue is then, because people see something like that, they assume you've taken a side. And then you start becoming isolated from that viewpoint because those sort of people just don't like you and don't want to be involved with you. So you kind of end up doing one thing more and more and more. more. Um, which is, you know, frustrating for me. Because I'm just, you know, it's like recently... Um, when um, the U.S. started firing cruise missiles into Syria, uh, targeting Jabhat al-Nusra, they um, hit a village. And what happened there is they, um, th th there were civilians killed there. There were videos of the civilians killed. There were videos of the remains of the rockets. We had listed the names of the people. And the Pentagon kept saying again and again and again, no one's been killed. And we had videos of the corpses. We had videos of them being pulled out of rubble. We had videos of the rockets hitting. Everything, and it was being completely ignored. I wrote about that because the kind of audience who would usually promote that material ignore my work. No one really picked up on that. A couple of newspapers like did a little thing about it, it nothing. And then, you know, the following week, I'd write about something else that is kind of more acceptable to the, a certain viewpoint, and it's in newspapers, it's absolutely everywhere. That's very frustrating for me. And then when you put in a lot of effort trying to put something like that together, it's, and then nobody bothers looking at it, because it's not from the perspective, you know, my kind of 
audience has grown expecting something, it's very frustrating. Um, but my approach is if I see something and I analyse it, I'll go whichever way the evidence goes. I don't, I, you know, I don't have a horse in the race. You know, obviously I don't... I mean, Syria is a horrendously complex conflict anyway, um, more than most people realise. Um, but I wouldn't say, oh, I'm picking one side over another and I'm just going to focus on that. That would just... Um, it, that's not what I'm about at all. So in that sense, it's very close to a classic human rights position, which is that there's a relatively independent set of norms which you can use to analyze the behavior of all sides in any given situation. Yeah, I, I think that's one way of looking at it. I mean, while I'm working, it's kind of, you know, I'm seeing all these videos that are coming from these groups, you know, this showing civilians, you know, the civilian casualties of these wars. And you, you know, that's the kind of people I'm writing for, not for governments or, you know, think tanks. I'm kind of writing, you know, I'm seeing that, and that's kind of, you know, I want to raise awareness of what's happening to them, not what's happening to, you know, the guy pushing the button 60 miles away. I have one uh, final question, and then we can open it up to the audience. I wonder, you've both commented on the uh, massive quantity uh, of social media material available from Syria. I wonder how you understand that. Is that just a sign of the times? Um, or um, how is it, uh, um, how has it become so essentially uh, a part of this conflict? I mean, part of it is because it, people are actually bothering to look at it now. I mean, very early on in the conflict, very little of this material is really making it out there. And then you have this situation now where you know, if, you, if something's posted on social media and it gets reported, it's usually a video from ISIS showing them killing someone. It's, there's lots of other stuff going on in Syria, but no, you know, the media have kind of moved on from the kind of earlier reports where, oh, they're using cluster bombs, oh, they're using jets, so on. So that's just day to day in Syria now. Um, so it's kind of like now, it, sometimes it feels like ISIS are kind of just responsible for the news coverage because they're coming up with <laughs> more and more horrible ways to shock the world. And it's like they've kind of, they're just escalating with every video now. Um, and, you know, that's, there's so much information still coming from Syria. And now, rather than it being kind of ignored because people don't know how to verify it, they're ignoring it because it's just become, you know, a day-to-day -day thing. And it's kind of the same result, the information is being ignored. Oh, well, I think in the first period, uh, uh, covering uh, the activities of the revolution, the uprising, uh, was by uh, citizen journalists, mm -hmm. people, uh, young people generally. Um, there was no separation, no gap between the act of protest and the act of uh, 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 covering it right. to, uh, and to uh, se sending it to uh, TV channels and social media sites and so on. Uh, this is because we don't have journalists. Uh, uh, Syria was closed to uh, the international media, mm -hmm. and we don't have independent uh, uh, media outlets. Uh, that's why um, tens, uh, indeed hundreds of uh, such journalists were c killed during the first uh, uh, year of the uh, revolution because anyone could be, at that time, anyone literally, could be a citizen journalist. Uh, every uh, young uh, man and woman has a, his camera, has his mobile phone, and would uh, take photos of demonstrations, of rallies. Of, uh, but now then developed another uh, phenomena of embedded journalists. I mean, these military uh, brigades in Syria, each one yeah. developed its own uh, uh, media uh, people, and they uh, cover the activities, and uh, and they um, don't cover any activities against. Uh, so um, this uh, this phenomena of new embedded journalists uh, has been developing in the last two years, and you know the. Uh, high professional level of uh, embedded journalists of <laughs> ISIS, for instance, mm -hmm. they are coming from many of them. I think uh, came from Europe. Good film schools. Yeah. 
Shall we, um, shall we have some questions? Vasif, do we need a microphone for this, or will people just shout? Okay. There's a mic right here. Thank you for um, the enlightening session that you've given us so far, however heavy it actually is. Um, my question is to Elliot. Um, your work, of course, exposes a lot of the details that go into war strategy. If, if we're going to look at it in terms of war strategy, we're talking about locations, we're talking about movements, we're talking about the next step in whatever is going to happen. Does it ever haunt you personally how much your work um, is shaping the conflict or it could be shaping the conflict? Because you personally cannot really control who views your website or who looks at the work that you're doing. So for all you know, ISIS could be watching and saying, okay, well, Elliot deducted that the next move of the Syrian army is going to be this, so we need to go to this location, or it could be the other way around. So does it ever occur to you, do you think about it, have you faced something like that in your work? Um, for Syria, that's not been too much of an issue. There has been some stuff I've done that I've realized would be um, very applicable to uh, military situations. For example, it became apparent a lot of activists were filming from the same location day in, day out. And had someone figured that out from their videos, which I did, and they had access to artillery, then they could have easily targeted that exact position. So, uh, you know, you know not to write about stuff like that. On the other hand, when I'm talking to organizations who speak to activists, I tell them, you know, this is what I've been able to figure out from their videos, tell them to stop doing this stuff. Um, <laughs> It was interesting with the James Foley video because it was notable after that video, um, the videos they released tend to have less interesting backgrounds <laughs> until they started to really want to show off where they were and then they were filming stuff purposely so people could kind of figure out where they were. Um, so that was noticeable, but it was still clear the region they were in just based off the terrain and that they wouldn't be kind of driving around Syria with their hostages trying to find new places to film. They were still in Raqqa and really, Figuring out exactly where that was wasn't really a, um, much use to anyone apart from establishing, yes, they were in this location. And it was clear that US intelligence and other agencies were aware of that. Um, I have been told by several people that among various intelligence communities in various countries that uh, my work is very popular um, and widely read. Um, and it's, I mean, I, I've spoken to various organizations. I, I, I remember doing um, a conference with one organization who um, work in intelligence, and they were show looking at my work, and I showed them what I'd been doing with MH17, and they were saying, you know, one guy got up and said, this is exa exactly the sort of stuff uh, we should be doing. And that was um, NATO intelligence. <laughs> and this, this is kind of the thing, this isn't really being done that widely by anyone, including intelligence agencies. It was interesting recently, the CIA actually announced that they would be start using sort of open source and social media material more adding in combination with different kinds of intelligence because at the moment they tend to have like this is one type of intelligence this is another type this is another type they don't kind of cross but now they're taking a different approach um and i do wonder where that idea came from but um it, yeah i mean it's the applications for this kind of work of all kinds of different fields and it's not just to do with conflicts it can do with lots of other areas another um work i'm doing with the organized crime and corruption reporting project is using open source material like uh, business records to investigate um, uh, money laundering. And that's the same kind of principle, it's an open source investigation, but it's in a completely different area. Um, so, yeah, I do, it doesn't haunt me, but I am aware of it. historical uh, uh, narrative, as Mr. Yassin has pointed out. I'm uh, interested in knowing uh, why does uh, Mr. Yassin seem to be very keen on being able to come up with the historical uh, background or the historical uh, uh, narrative of the conflict uh, through uh, the work uh, Mr. Elliot is doing, while it is very obviously 
uh, not focusing on the historical part, more likely or more uh, generally speaking, uh, focusing on uh, analyzing and proving and disproving certain information and uh, dealing with it as raw data. Uh, the other uh, thing I uh, want to point out is I've worked before in a, within an entity that uh, uh, was involved in uh, large broadcast of protests and uh, things like that inside Syria. And uh, we uh, essentially started our work because we believe that what happened in Syria in the 80s in uh, Hama uh, massacres, we thought it only happened because it wasn't covered. Uh, it was only possible to happen because it wasn't covered. Then uh, we decided that someone should be documenting and broadcasting what is going on in order to let everybody know so this doesn't happen again. Well, it didn't just not work, it actually backfired at us because uh, when, uh, when uh, the regime forces broke into the uh, square in Homs and uh, they killed uh, hundreds of people almost live on air, the massacre was almost <coughs> broadcasted live on air, um, and nothing happened, basically. You know, like the regime wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, uh, doing any uh, worse after that. Uh, it actually gave a very big uh, and clear green light, uh, light to the regime to continue doing what it is, what it is doing. And uh, also, again, uh, the imagery that is going on from every side, everybody uses imagery now, and uh, more elaborately uh, than anybody else does the, uh, the ISIS. And obviously because they're very much aware of the uh, fact that we are preempted with a lot of uh, um, uh, imagery of violence from everyday media that we see, not just news. Uh, and uh, they are being able to produce something that meets our expectations of uh, uh, blockbusters, American blockbusters or something. Uh, so there is a lot of ethical uh, uh, problems uh, regarding the whole uh, uh, imagery uh, and the images and photo, uh, videos coming out from Syria. Other than being able to uh, come up with the historical narrative of, of these things or not, there is real and uh, critical, uh, critical uh, questions regarding the whole uh, uh, purpose or the whole purpose uh, media claims to to, to, to uh, serve and uh, the uh, actual is <coughs> coming out to it. Well, I'm Syrian and uh, I lived all my life in Syria. I've been living in Turkey for less than a year and a half and I'm interested in the history of my country and the culture and the memory and everything. And this uh, event is about image, ethics, action, live videos, human rights, and civic activism in Syria. It is not only about news, and it is not something professional, narrow, uh, uh, narrow perspective. We are speaking about issues of ethics and about, so, about the truth, I think, about the authenticity of representation about if these images are uh, real or fake about uh, what the what's what do they represent for Syrians uh, I understand that uh, Mr. Elliot is uh, interested in these uh, from an independent perspective but I cannot be uh, independent I was uh, I was political myself and I am interested in what's happening in uh, my country. I live in, uh, actually I lived for two, two uh, years and a half uh, or so months uh, in Syria after the beginning of the uprising and uh, I was always I think all my active life an agent in the struggle so uh, I, I am not independent. You can you can say that I, I, I am not trying to be objective. I am not objective. I am an agent in the struggle, and I say this is right and this is wrong. This is just and this is unjust. Uh, I don't want to uh, concentrate on some personal issues, but um, I spent all my life in this struggle, so I am interested in. Uh, developing a narrative um, that support our struggle for justice and uh, for freedom. Of course, 
I don't want to tell lies. I don't want to invent uh, non-existent uh, uh, facts, but I am uh, an agent in the struggle, and I want our uh, struggle to uh, be uh, to give fruits of justice and freedom uh, to our people. For the, uh, I'm sorry. The next, uh, the second question was. Um, was uh, talking about uh, how the uh, backfiring. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I still think that uh, uh, having this huge body of imagery from Syria is something great and something good. I, I was in prison when Hama, the massacre of Hama happened, and. Uh, but even my family heard about this uh, in whispers after months of what happened. Uh, what happened. Now we, I am here in Istanbul, and my friends, Syrians, uh, 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 the uh, Syrian diaspora are scattered everywhere in the world. But they know day by day what's happening in Idlib, and Daraa, and Duma, and uh, Aleppo, and everywhere in the country. I think, well. There is no uh, substantial uh, um, outcomes from this huge imagery, actually. And some people uh, argue that um, these horrible images uh, uh, make death is natural. And the world is fed up with this. What, what comes uh, from Syria is death. Yesterday was death. And the day before yesterday was death, and it is going like this. So why we uh, um, why we show interest in, in this? But it is very important, I think, for those uh, ethical agents uh, uh, in the world, and of course for us uh, Syrians, for our culture, for our memory, for our future, to to see these images, to uh, read and to uh, tell our story, because if we don't tell our story, I think um, it will be forgotten. And we are, um, we are in battle against uh, forgetfulness mm -hmm. uh, in our country and in the world. Though the world is insistent, still insistent not to hear, but we have to go on this struggle. This is, this is one side of our struggle, I think, to, uh, to uh, tell our story, to bring images, to uh, cover it, to, uh, yeah, to speak it. Uh, but we don't we create our own holocaust then uh, during that? Why would I want any sort of, I mean, why would anyone want a part of their future identity that they're trying to now discover and uh, and listen, basically. Why would anybody want a, a, a Holocaust to be part of it? Or why do I want to give this sort of uh, sacredness to, to uh, some uh, horrible incidents? Why can't I keep it at, uh, at its uh, very uh, bad, uh, already bad enough uh, uh, level? I mean, it is an incident where a lot of people were being killed for political reasons by a dictator, and that's that. Why do I have to give it uh, more uh, sort of uh, um, uh, fictional or not fictional, in, uh, I mean, I don't mean fake, but more uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, making it, uh, making a legend out of, out of it and uh, keep uh, uh, allowing any future uh, entity in Syria, any future power in Syria to make use of, of these uh, uh, incidents that we so uh, uh, deeply uh, 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 printed or like uh, uh, we so uh, deeply held to, to uh, identify ourselves with and then allowing them the chance to uh, use it to achieve their own political agenda which is uh, something uh, very possible and has happened in a lot of places in the world uh, in a lot of countries where there have been uh, major uh, political uh, the struggle, a lot of people, uh, civilians or even non-civilians, died, uh, and the next uh, uh, person to make it to power is going to definitely make some sort of a, a commercial or political, in this case, use of the uh, of the situation. And I'm also not speaking about the. Uh, uh, this is one thing. I'm not only speaking about the uh, uh, the uh, political side of it, um, uh, or the, uh, the the 
as uh, tangible part of it. I'm talking about a more actually uh, uh, tangible side of things, where it actually happened that uh, the regime escalated violence in a, in a way that was not preceded after uh, the, uh, the Homs massacre. Uh, and that actually uh, meant that more people died, more real people died because we were so much uh, uh, trusting uh, the, uh, the role of media and the role of knowledge. We thought that just merely knowledge means if you know that something bad is about to happen, that's enough to make it not happen. And we discovered that this is not true. And uh, media still does not uh, sort of uh, even reconsider uh, certain values that must be reconsidered. Well, I don't, tell, I don't know if it is bad or good that Syrian revolution is without uh, leadership, without central body to lead and to plan and to, uh, uh, to, to cover it in uh, media. And for about 50 years, uh, Syria was closed from the world and um, my generation Thousands of people, tens of thousands of people spent long times in prison or were killed. So we don't have a political class or uh, a wider uh, active uh, people. This is what led that the uh, Syrian uprising was really grassroots and was deeply local. I mean, people who are protesting in homes have no. Um, uh, um, no connections with people in Hama, for instance, or in Damascus, or in Halab, or in Raqqa. It was Syria is a society that was not only divided on um, confessional lines; it was also divided on uh, regional lines, and uh, the effect of uh, of despotism for. Um, about two generations since 1963, um, well, uh, left the country without credible uh, political and even cultural leaders. I think uh, I am saying this to say that no one planned things to go the way you you spoke about what happened in Homs. People were people show that. Uh, in Tunisia, they succeed in toppling the regime in uh, 28 days. In Egypt, in 18 days, and they thought that this could be done in Syria. And this is what the Libyan began to do before the Syrians, and in Yemen, and in Bahrain. So Syria was the fifth country, oh, yes, fifth, uh, sixth country in the Arab world. <laughs> and they thought that it could be the same. Sorry, can we can we open the? Are there questions in the back? The back always gets left behind. Maybe someone, yeah, right here. I, I just wanted to ask a question. There's different things about the website that you showed us prior to this. Um, you mentioned that there was a So there's um, going to be basically two levels. Um, most of these accounts we're going to be working with are associated with certain areas, usually quite small geographical areas. That'll be um, one thing we're going to be geotagging to every single one of these accounts. What it, we're also geotagging, as we're finding all these names of locations, you know, every small village, everything we can find, they'll also be geotagged. So when you have a post and it says there's been a chemical attack, it'll first look at the uh, geo geotag for that account. If it says there's been a chemical attack in this village, it'll then use that as the more precise location of where this has occurred. Um, the one thing to understand about this, this is really intended to be the first step of a process. It's kind of making the discovery process something that's very quick. 
Then building on that, you do the actual uh, further analysis. You say, okay, these po posts are being made from here. Let's see what information there is. Can we actually you know, contact people on the ground? Can we actually you know, geolocate this using video analysis or picture analysis? And building on it from there. Um, as it stands, the kind of discovery process is something that hardly anyone's doing and can take a very long time. So um, I'm trying to bring that to as many people as possible so we can get to the more meatier part of it, which is actually verifying and analyzing the content. Thank you. <coughs> um, so does it mean that there is some kind of tight cooperation between Facebook and you or Twitter and you, or it's just um, two people or no, it's, it's, it's just um, basically looking at the feeds and seeing what's coming through, and um, there's no cooperation um, on that particular project with those organizations. Sure, in the front here. Uh, in the process of taking your videos and trying to maybe classify them and certain criteria you have in mind, uh, did you come upon a pattern? of using different kinds of weapons. For example, why would the regime use gas, rockets at a certain area at a certain time? And then why would uh, they use barrack bombs in certain city? Did you come up on such a thing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in certain areas, it came, became very clear where there was kind of intense use of bow bombs. The um, I showed you the volcano rockets, the smaller type of very short ranges, but they were being used intensively in areas. They're also being heavily attacked by bow bombs, and they're using them to force surrenders, um, which we saw around Damascus, and they kind of do this systematically. One area just get hammered for weeks until that area basically had a truce. And then they move on to the next area, and the next area, and the next area. In certain areas, like Capazita, that's a really interesting area because we've seen chlorine bow bombs being used there for the first time. First time we saw um, uh, smirch um, cluster rockets being used there as well. Um, it seemed there that was a, um, a case of punishing the population for supporting opposition groups who are fighting nearby. Um, you can continually see these patterns. Um, the issue is you sometimes you spend so much time just looking at these videos saying, oh, there's been this kind of attack here. You miss the kind of wider context of what's happening, which is something you touched on earlier, where you just you have to understand more than you know, what's in these videos. You say, okay, what's actually happening? you know, politically and militarily and everything else that's happening in those areas. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can glean a massive amount of information from these videos. And another example of something we're working on at the moment is with um, uh, Ukraine ME-17, we've actually discovered, um, uh, what more people do with ME-17, we managed to find a missile launcher that shot it down, came from Russia, and we found the specific unit it came from. And now we're going through all the soldiers' social media profiles to re basically reconstruct that entire unit using all the pictures they've been posting, because there's so many of them, so many soldiers just taking pictures of everything. And um, it's a hugely useful resource just being able to use this information. The thing to understand, this, this, these videos and posts aren't just floating by themselves in the, uh, they're on the internet. They're part of a network of information. And once you start establishing that network and seeing what that tells you, that can be a very powerful tool for discovery. There's a question over here. Yeah. Uh, my, my question is uh, for you, Mr. Uh, first of all, uh, I was con congratulating for your uh, work. It's, uh, uh, obviously, you put a lot of uh, work on the Kuwait Kuwait media and uh, analyzing it, analyzing them. But uh, my question is about the uh, content of these uh, pictures and videos that you choose to uh, analyze. Ukraine to be objective, but uh, I think most of the uh, most of the media uh, you analyze is about the uh, uh, alleged uh, alleged war crimes of uh, the Assad regime and uh, about the uh, Syrian gas uh, attack or the other. Yeah, 
Yeah, well, I mean, part of it is because how um, social media and this was being used, the opposition were kind of more effective with using this kind of material. Um, you know, some, some of the other work I've done, though, has been, um, a, a, you know, sometimes you can identify opposition war crimes. Um, I was one of the first people to find the um, Abu Sakar video, the um, cannibal video that you're probably familiar with from Syria. Um, another good example of um, one video I found, there were a group of men who had been captured, and they were Syrian government soldiers, and they'd been captured, and the video was filmed by one group, and they say, we've captured these guys in an ambush. In the second video filmed by another group, all the guys were dead, and they say, we killed these guys in an ambush. And you could clearly tell that they'd killed these prisoners, and um, you know, so one group had done it, and the other group had filmed it when they'd been captured. That kind of material is there also. You can also, this is something you can identify in these videos. They've kind of become a bit wise to filming their war crimes um, recently. But, you know, going back, there's plenty of videos showing them doing various war crimes. Uh, you know, lots of stuff you can read in stuff that isn't obvious straight away. But it is really about how the kind of Syrian opposition were more effective with using social media and open source information early on in the conflict compared to the Syrian government who ended up kind of playing catch up a bit. Just want to say that the only the regime has uh, helicopters and fighter jets and scud missiles, and so I don't think this is uh, Elliot's fault. I saw a hand in the back there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have a I have a question. Uh, two questions. Um, the one is how many people were at um, at and off actually watching these videos? Because that seems like a a very hard job for one person to do. <laughs> uh, and so it's a really so, so that and that goes uh, onto your onto the training question. Um, do you also are you able to um, analyze the video without watching it the same way that you can do with remote sensing imaging? Is there a way that you can sort of um, take the sound out and analyze it for you know machine learning so that you can yeah, is there, uh, and the third question is, can you analyze the network by which the post um, is is dispersed over social media so that you can account for its, uh, uh, what's called the truth, whatever it is, that, that validity, yeah. So what was the first question again, <laughs> sorry? The first question is, how many people work with you? Okay, um, it's basically, basically I am a cat, basically, and um, it's a very hard job. And um, I, but I have, um, since I've been doing my work in Ukraine, I've been kind of recruiting volunteers. They're kind of people who've been doing their own work, and I've kind of brought them together to one place, and we work a lot on projects. Um, as for training, I mean, for machine learning, there's various organizations trying to do this. It's just, it, I find the issue is, it's just not as good as having a real person looking at this stuff. Um, and it's just as simple as that. Um, and what was your last question, sorry? Yeah, in terms of the validity of how... Tracking the dispersion of the... Okay, people have actually done that. Um, yeah, that's actually been done, um, for example, with um, networks linked to ISIS. People have been uh, analysing that. So that's something that's doable. Sometimes it's... Someone asks, can you track an individual image? And that's not always possible, but you can see, look at the behaviour of people on a network like Twitter and see, okay, who's posting stuff, who's sharing it, who's kind of, you know, where the kind of core areas this is happening. So that's something that definitely can be done and has been done. I think we have time for one or maybe two short last questions. Raise your hands high. Oh, right. Yep. Right here? Yeah. Hi, I'm Roger from Windows. Um, I just had a few comments and a few questions. I think, Can you uh, explain what Witness is, for those uh, who don't know? Witness uh, is an international human rights organization based out of New York. We focus on how to use video to protect and promote human rights and to sustain accountability. So we do a lot of what Elliot is doing right now. And um, I want to thank you all over there, particularly you guys. Um, <laughs> for really presenting this. But I think the biggest challenge for me right now in terms of the kind of work we're doing is the um, communication channels. I think that a lot of the locals on the ground do not have access to key stakeholders who could really inform their work. A lot of people on the ground are looking for content like this, but when it's online on a website, it's gonna be really challenging for people in more 
isolated or more um, you know areas under siege to really be able to have this information. So when they're on the ground documenting, they have access to those practices. And in addition to that, there is an overabundance of footage, I think, and, and personally in my opinion, that is repetitive. And, um, and a lot of that has to do not, not with the activists themselves, but because of the fact that there is no guidance in, in terms of what are the documentation gaps. There is a bunch of video footage right now that proves there are crimes being committed. The world knows crimes are being committed. But again, just like Elliot, when you touched up on linkage and a few other things uh, like that, how do you connect these crimes to the perpetrators that are there? Um, this is all valuable, valuable, valuable information that people need on the ground. And from our contacts, the people on the ground, they are but they're really, really asking for more of this information. So my big question is, how could we really begin to strengthen these communication channels? How could, between key stakeholders, between individuals like us and people on the ground, how could they, how could, how, like, in what way can we ensure that they have the information they need so when they are on the ground risking their lives, they're doing it and they understand exactly what they need to be capturing versus capturing repetitive content that is, again, they're putting themselves at risk, and you know there are investigators out there, researchers out there who need specific types of information that could really inform, you know, cases that are being investigated, and and could really help inform their work. Um, that's um, actually an area I'm actually um, planning my PhD on. Um, <laughs> so it's an area I'm really interested in. That, this is one issue I see again and again. Have um, you know? There needs to be stronger networks, and these networks need to go to the kind of people who can do something with the information that's being produced and say to people, you know, this is what we need. It's frustrating to see someone filming a video and risking their life and then missing the one key part of that video because they don't know what they're supposed to be filming to produce something useful. And until, um, you, you know, I, I'm quite keen on kind of developing a kind of a kind of a global network of people working with this material in different fields so we can say, you know, this is the kind of, you know, the, what we expect, what we need, this is the standards we need to establish, this is where we, you know, we need to step, make people, sure people aren't picking up cluster bombs to film, because that's something I've seen repeatedly in Syria, and that's, you know, getting people killed. It's, but, you know, as someone else said earlier, if you're taking all these risks and all that's happening is that it makes things worse, then, you know, What's the, you know, it, that's terrible. So we need to have these networks where this kind of material can be escalated through the different levels of organizations to governments to actually have an effect rather than it just kind of swimming around the bottom, you know, on people's YouTube channels, you know, just being seen by the odd journalists and not really achieving anything. Because it's, you know, horrendous seeing, you know, what people went through on August 21st knowing that absolutely kind of nothing's happened apart from this, you know, giving up this chemical weapons program, but kind of not really. Final question. Um, my question is for Elliot, first of all, thank you all. My question is, do you think um, your identity and your location in any way affected the credibility of what your blog or your website was publishing? In other words, do you think if you had been inside of Syria, or if you had been Syrian or of Syrian origin, that would have in any way lent itself or been against the credibility of your content and your technique? Or do you think those things of themselves? In other words, do you think if someone had done the same work, but was of Syrian origin, they would have been considered too close to the content? Or not not for you personally, but for people who use the information such as journalists, um, human rights watch, intelligence agencies, etc. Um one thing I've always done with my work is I'm very transparent about my sources. The great thing about open source is you can say this is what I'm using. I, I always go through stuff step by step. I can see your point if I was a Syrian it might make people assume I was kind of, you know, taking a side in the conflict or was covering my viewpoint. But, um, you know, the work I do, I've, I've, I mean, my background is in finance and administration and nothing to do with this kind of work. And I've been able to establish myself in this way because I've been very consistent about the way I work. I've been very transparent. And, um, you know, I, I, because of the way I work, I've not really been wrong on stuff. And this is what's important. I've been consistent with this. And I, I, people can look at me and say, okay, we know he's consistent. Usually when I see people trying to do the same work I do, the problem is they aren't consistent or they clearly pick a side. There's one guy who um, blogs on Ukraine. He's very, very pro-Ukrainian. And he does really good work on like, geolocation and verification. 
but no one really takes that much notice of it in the media because he says stuff like he calls the Russians terror Russians and you know he uses all this very loaded language. So I, I always try to remain as neutral as possible in the way I write and be as transparent as possible. But it also helped that I was you know behind a name that no one knew who I was and I was kind of this mysterious figure. So you know maybe if I had said from day one oh I'm Syrian, people may have said oh well he's just going to be picking a side so why bother reading it. Thank you. <laughs> So thank you both very much.